Hey everyone, today I want to share with you some mathematics I discovered while playing around with the geometry of this puzzle. It's known as the Geranium puzzle. I didn't find any other animations or simulators of this puzzle online, so I decided to write one myself. First I struggled with implementation, but then discovered some mathematics which helped me tremendously. A while ago I stumbled across the Geranium puzzle shown here in its solved state. You do a move by picking a circle and rotating it by 36 degrees, a tenth of a whole rotation. The aim is to get it back into the starting configuration, which is really difficult. What makes it so difficult is that pieces do not always align nicely and restricting the moves that you can do. This move for example is not allowed because of these two pieces blocking the rotation. To get started, let's define the geometry. We align the center of the puzzle with the origin 0, 0. Clearly, the puzzle is made up of 5 circles, but where exactly are these located? Well, the right circle could be centered at 1, 0. The other circles are then rotations by 72 degrees around the origin. The other centers can be calculated using the cosine and sine functions. After evaluating these expressions, we see that the coordinates have a lot of nested square roots in them. Quite horrendous, to be honest. Alright, so now that we've fixed the centers of the circles, you may ask, well, what's the radius of the circles? Actually, we have some freedom here. Anything between about 1.2 and 1.5 would work. Note that the puzzle stays fully functional for any such value of r. However, I chose the radius where the sides of the puzzle pieces align best. This radius turns out to be, pause here if you want to work it out yourself from scratch, square root of 4 minus square root of 5. Since I wanted to write a simulator of this puzzle, I needed to know the exact coordinates of the pieces and how they rotate. This point here, for example, has these coordinates. A rotation by 36 degrees using this circle maps it to these coordinates. Using numerical approximations here probably is a bad idea, because after many rotations the pieces may get all wonky and the puzzle might get stuck, as in, the computer thinks that pieces cross the circle you are trying to rotate and blocks the move. Ok, so we have to use exact coordinates. But do I really have to teach my computer how to handle nested square roots? Nope, but we'll come to that. I chose the radius square root of 4 minus square root of 5, not only because it is the most aesthetically pleasing, it also gives rise to some nice mathematics. For instance, think about how you would calculate the coordinates of this intersection. Maybe you would do it by calculating the intersections of these two circles. This would work, but here's a simpler way. Note that this intersection on the left here lines up exactly at minus 2. This is because of the value of r I chose. To calculate the intersection now, we simply need to do a rotation of 144 degrees clockwise around the origin. But wait, there's more to discover here. Check out this line. The midpoint exactly aligns with this other intersection of two circles. This is also because of the special value of r. Hence you reach it by adding one blue and one orange arrow. In fact, all corners of the puzzle pieces can be constructed by adding some of these ten arrows together. For me this was very surprising. So you may ask, what's the point of all this? Well, it makes calculating the movements of the pieces for the computer way easier. The script that animates this video does not need to handle square roots at all, yet it performs rotations with no loss of precision you would otherwise get if you use numerical approximations. Instead, all it does is use vectors and matrices with integer entries only. This is a piece of cake for the computer. For the remainder of this video I want to show you how that works, but first let's simplify our observation a bit. We actually only need 5 of these arrows, because the other 5 are inverses. We would simply say, instead of one cyan arrow, we use minus one red arrow. Actually, even the purple arrow is not needed, as its inverse equals the sum of the other four vectors, shown here with a regular pentagon. Therefore, all corners of the puzzle pieces can be represented using a combination of only these four arrows. It turns out that the representation is also unique, as in, all corners of the puzzle pieces, in whatever state the puzzle is in, can be represented in exactly one way by adding or subtracting these four arrows. 
I promised we'd be using vectors and matrices. So how does that work? We can map these arrows to four-dimensional vectors. We define the red arrow to correspond to the first unit vector, and we do the same for the other three arrows. The inverses correspond simply to the negative versions of the four vectors we just defined. Instead of adding arrows, we add these four-dimensional vectors, which means that the two missing arrows have the following coordinates as demonstrated with the pentagon earlier. Let's rearrange them in the most natural order. Now our leftover task is to find a matrix which maps the red vector to the orange vector and that to the yellow vector, etc. around the circle. Pause here if you want to figure it out yourself. A small hint if you got stuck, as always with matrices, the unit vectors here corresponding to the red, yellow, green and light blue arrows are mapped to the columns of the matrix. Alright, indeed these four vectors form the columns of the matrix. We can check that this matrix does the job as required by plugging in all 10 vectors. Alrighty, let's get back to our example rotation from earlier. From the origin we walk blue backwards, then yellow, and finally red backwards. Hence the four-dimensional vector corresponding to our point turns out to be minus 1, 1, 0, minus 1. As our four-dimensional matrix rotates around the origin, we first have to add the arrow from the circle center to the origin. Since green is going the other way, we write minus 1 into the third entry of our vector. Now we can do the rotation and multiply this vector with the matrix. But note that we are now using arrows other than the four we've shown on the left. We can flip them, as for example cyan is the same as minus red. Now this looks much better, but we are still using the purple arrow. We can get rid of it using the pentagon trick. Note now that the arrows are aligned with the coordinates of our vector. Two red, two yellow, one green and two blue. Finally, we add the arrow from the origin to the circle center, i.e. we add one more green. And we're done. In summary, to perform a rotation, for each coordinate we merely need to be able to add vectors and multiply with matrices. Now the computer still needs to know where to draw the pieces on the screen, so we need to convert our four-dimensional vectors back into x and y coordinates. To do that, we use this 2x4 matrix containing some values of the cosine and sine function. We actually can use numerical approximations here, because the error does not propagate, as we do not continue our calculations with the result. So that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed this little fun dive into the geometry of the geranium puzzle. If you want to know more about what's happening behind the scenes, you should read up on cyclotomic fields. They also come up in algebraic number theory, for example, in the proof of Fermat's last theorem. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye.